On this Thanksgiving Day, WTIC presents a special edition of Dick Bertel's Americana. The sound of the meeting house bell summoning the villagers to services on a Thanksgiving morning more than 150 years ago. This is Dick Bertel at Old Sturbridge Village, Massachusetts. Today we're going to relive that special day as our forefathers would have celebrated it. Thanksgiving was New England's greatest holiday, and it is also New England's greatest contribution to American holidays. A young man in Thomaston, Maine, noted in his diary on Thanksgiving Day in 1824, this is the day which has been set apart by the rulers of our state to offer our thanks to our almighty benefactor for the favors and blessings of the past year. Thanks to the supreme majesty of heaven for his kindness, and may the silent but sincere thanks of every heart ascend to the throne of a just and generous God and there plead for renewed blessings. Join us, won't you, as we walk through a Thanksgiving of yesterday at Old Sturbridge Village. I'm talking now with Jim Keeney, director of the News Bureau here at Old Sturbridge Village. We're heading into the village itself, and Jim, I, I thought perhaps you might be able to tell us a bit about the background of Thanksgiving. What was it like during the early part of the 19th century at a village such as Old Sturbridge Village? Was it a, a very festive day? Uh, yes, it was. It was the, the festive day of the year. It was a day of uh, family reunion, a day of... Uh, festive eating, and it was also a, a day, a, a religious day, a day of church services, and uh, sportsmanship, turkey shooting. A turkey shoot? How did a turkey shoot work? Well, I'm going to let Mr. Willman, who is our assistant director of crafts here, who uh, also uh, fires our musket, I'm going to let him tell you about the turkey shoot, and perhaps... Uh, show you how the musket was used in the turkey shoot. Well, Bob, how, how did a, a turkey shoot work? Well, they worked in many ways. It depended upon the specific organization of every town. The most common way, however, was to uh, take the turkey, put it in a box with a hole in the top at about 50 yards distance from the shooters. And uh, the shooters were using live ammunition to shoot at the head of the turkey. If they hit any other part of the body, that would be the end of the turkey and the dinner. Well, Bob, you have a, a musket here, which we're actually going to fire. This is a uh, Springfield musket. It, it was made in 1853, but basically uh, it's very similar to those that were developed in the late 1830s and 40s. Now, what was involved in loading and firing the weapon? Well, this is a percussion weapon, so that the first thing we'll do is to pull the ramrod. We have a flask of powder, and this is poured into the barrel in a predetermined measure. Uh, it you don't have to be too careful with this type of thing because there's not an intense volume of pressure in, uh, involved. But uh, generally, the rule was you had the ball in your hand, and if you could cover the ball with the powder, that was about enough to get a fairly good shot. We will uh, first ram down some paper on top of the powder in order to prevent it from being too loose behind the ball. Now, paper was a common source, by the way, uh, of holding the powder in, also cloth, little cloth patch. Now we'll put a ball on top of it All right. and ram that down. And that should be in tight enough. Return the ram rod to the thimbles. And bring it to half cock. The only other thing we need is a percussion cap. Are we all set there We're all ready to, to fire. fire our musket? Uh -huh. And with any luck, she'll go first time. Well, that's the way it was done. And, uh, of course, if he missed, then did he get another chance, the, uh, the participant? No, generally he had to take his turn. It would go through every other participant. And if all of them missed, which was very unlikely, then uh, he'd have another chance at it. Well, thank you very much, Bob, for showing us how a turkey shoot would work on Thanksgiving Day back in the early 19th century. You're very welcome. Well, Jim, 
Uh, I suppose the uh, village store was the center of activities during the uh, Thanksgiving holiday, was it? Well, I think there were some things that uh, had to be picked up as a village store, uh, but most of the uh, ingredients of the Thanksgiving dinner came off the farm. They came to the general store for a few things, maybe yard goods, uh, china, crockery, spices, uh, imports, perhaps uh, uh, liquors, brandy, or imported wines. A lot of the utensils that the housewives worked with in those early days were made by the cabinet maker in town, weren't they? Yes, he, he turned out everything of, uh, say, in wood, uh, the bowls, and there were wooden plates, trencher plates used, and perhaps the housewife would need a rolling pin to roll out her Thanksgiving pies, and she could get that from the cabinet maker. Let's visit the uh, cabinet shop then, shall we? Yes, let's do that. Well, this uh, is the cabinet shop here. It's a weather-beaten old uh, building. Those red boards have seen many, many years, haven't they? Yes, I'd say they've seen more than 150 years. Let's go in and meet uh, Frank Blackman, our cabinet maker. Well, I see Mr. Blackman is at work here. Yes, he's working on a 200-year-old foot treadle lathe. Well, let's find out how this foot treadle lathe works. Frank, can I interrupt you for a moment? Yes, sir. What are you working on, a rolling pin? A rolling pin, sir, made out of a piece of maple. Now, we have one hanging here from the wall, and this is a rather unusual rolling pin, I understand, because of its taper. What was the taper for? What advantage did this give to the housewife? Well, the uh, elderly ladies tell me that uh, the dough will never stick to the rolling pin the way it does with a flat one. It gives more pressure in the center where you would need it most. Now, this is a, a foot treadle lathe that you've got here. You operate the, uh, the power and um, you, you press a, a, a foot a, treadle. A foot treadle. <laughs> yes, sir. Once you get it going, rolling, while you, you start and cut. You see, you start with a square block of wood, and then you get the corners knocked off and turn it down around. And then you shape it following the old time pattern. You can see this beginning to take shape now under my cutting tool here. If we were to leave you alone, how long would it take you to finish this rolling pin? A couple of hours. And Frank, what would one of these rolling pins sell for in those early days? Well, I understand they'd sell for about six cents a piece. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Well, Jim, that, that was fascinating. Where do we uh, head for next? I think we should go down to the blacksmith shop. Uh, the blacksmith, of course, was the only source of hardware. There were no mail order stores around or no hardware stores. So the housewife or the farmer would have to go to the blacksmith uh, for any ironware that was used in the, uh, anywhere on the farm and particularly in the kitchen. So if we go down to the blacksmith, we may uh, see him shaping up something for Thanksgiving. Jim, this uh, blacksmith shop is made of stone. Is that rather unusual? Yes, it is most unusual. There are very few stone buildings or granite block buildings in New England. Uh, this one came from Bolton, Massachusetts. It, it is an unusual building. Well, let's go in. And the blacksmith, as you can hear, is obviously at work. Who is our blacksmith, Jim? That's Frank Grapes. Let's meet him. Frank? Can, uh, can we talk to you for just a moment? Can you step over here? Frank, you're working on some skewers, I understand, and uh, these would be the, the skewers that the housewife would use for her Thanksgiving turkey. That's right. And uh, how do you go about making a, a skewer? Well, I just make it one now. You take a piece of iron, you draw it out thin, you bend the end over, I'll make a circle in it, and shot, kind of point it down. Can, uh, can <coughs> we watch you in operation? You can. All right, go ahead. Well, Frank is now um, working the bellows and uh, bringing the flame up to quite a, a high heat there. That's to get the metal, I guess, malleable. Yes, the, 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 the metal must be white hot uh, for him to shape it on the anvil. As soon as the metal is white, I think he's, he's almost ready now to pull it out of the fire. That, that piece of metal he has there is about, uh, oh, uh, better than a quarter inch thick, and I think the skewer will come down to... Uh, uh, maybe less than an eighth inch in thickness, and he has to taper it down to a point. And obviously he is beginning to 
bang it into shape with that anvil. Putting the point on it and, and setting it at the same time. Frank, I wonder if you'd put down the hammer for just a minute and let me know how long it takes you to, uh, to make a, a skewer of this nature. How long would it take you? Oh, to make one of them, <clears throat> you know, probably 20 minutes. What would you get for something like this, Frank? Oh, I should say about two cents. Boy, that's, uh, that's a low price for the amount of work and time that went into the well, labor making of it. Well, labor was low at that time, too. I suppose it was. Thank you very much, You're Frank. Welcome. Well, f Jim, I guess the, the logical place next would be to head for the kitchen. Yes, let's go up to the Plenty Freeman farm and see what they're doing in the kitchen up there. Well, that sounds like an excellent idea. Jim, do you think we can hitch a ride on this wagon here as we head over to the farmhouse? Yes, I think George will take us up. George, will you take us up to the farm? Okay, let's get aboard. Come on. Now, I wonder if you could tell us about the farmhouse that we're going to visit. Well, this is typical of uh, New England farms. Uh, everybody farmed, of course, and most farmers had some sort of a sideline. The cabinet maker was a farmer, the blacksmith was a farmer. Uh, the minister was a farmer, the lawyer was a farmer, the storekeeper, because this was their source of food and it was a source of clothing from the sheep, uh, the wool that, that were spun, and, and uh, they grew their own flax. So uh, you, you practically had to farm to survive in this period. Well, Jim, we're approaching the farmhouse now. I'm anxious to get inside. Yes, well, let's get off here. George, will you drop us here, please? Okay. Ah. Uh. Let's go inside then, Jim, and uh, see what's being prepared for Thanksgiving dinner. Yes, I'd like dinner. you to come in and meet Mrs. Olive Butler. I, uh, I know she's uh, working in the fireplace because you can smell the good things cooking there. Let's go right in here. Oh, I can smell the aroma already. Oh, boy. Well, Mrs. Butler, it is a pleasure to meet you, and I want to talk with you and find out all about your Thanksgiving dinner. I understand that... Uh, Actually, the, the lady of the house had to start at least three days before the Thanksgiving dinner, and perhaps even before that, didn't she? Yes, she did. It was a long process. And uh, the three days before, she would make her fruit cake, her butter, cranberry sauce, plum pudding, and of course the sweetmeats. Those included stuffed dates and uh, canned fruits, nuts, and grape jelly. Well, that would keep her pretty busy. Now, yes. what about what about the next day, the day before Thanksgiving itself? Oh, the, the next day was a very busy day also. All the breads had to be prepared in the oven because you could only use this oven. Uh, it took two hours to get this oven hot enough before you could actually use it. Mm. So it was a long uh, process to do the baking. What about the pies? Did they do the pies as well? And the breads. Injun rye bread, whole wheat. White bread was a luxury perhaps served maybe just a few times a year, and Thanksgiving was one of the days. Pie, mince pie, apple, squash, and Marlboro pie. Marlboro pie was made of apples and lemon with an open face with a little design on the top. Now, the day of Thanksgiving itself was uh, quite a day because it began at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. Why so early? Because it took so long to, to uh, bake the turkey. The turkey had to be cleaned, plucked, and, and it was prepared the day before Thanksgiving. Also, the chickens were prepared the day before Thanksgiving for the chicken pie. The first thing you had to check, I guess, on Thanksgiving morning was the wood box. Had to make sure there was plenty of hardwood. Well, once that was out of the way, what did she uh, begin to do? Well, then she had to stuff her turkey, truss it, put it on the spit, skewer it on, and then, of course, it had to be turned. Perhaps the children helped turn it. It had to be turned at least every 25 minutes, all according to the heat. Now, uh, the vegetables, of course, were prepared on Thanksgiving morning. And what vegetables would be included in the menu? Squash. And, of course, they always had boiled onions and turnip and potatoes. And those were, some of those were cooked in the oven along with the chicken pie. Now, once this uh, had been taken care of, I guess everybody went to church. And then when they returned from church, they sat down to the Thanksgiving meal. What uh, did they used to drink with their Thanksgiving meal? 
Well, they had lots of tea, not too much coffee, but they had lots of cider. Mm. All the family drank the cider. They had it sweet and hard, and sometimes it was heated, sometimes ice cold. They drank a, a barrel per capita per year. <laughs> Sounds like a wonderful Thanksgiving meal, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Well, Jim, now that we've had our Thanksgiving meal, what would happen uh, during the rest of the day? Well, I think the men folks would probably get out of the house, but the women folks would tend to the chores, cleaning up and uh, doing the dishes. Uh, the men folks, I guess, would get outside into the fresh air. Which we're doing right now. Well, perhaps uh, light up their pipes, and, uh, look, look over the farm. Talk about uh, their harvests, uh, how they were, talk about the year uh, going before and what kind of a year it was and, and uh, uh, what kind of crops they had, how fortunate they were uh, during the year. Walk, walk around through the farm as we are and uh, of course at this time of the year, after everything is in, uh, it's barren, uh, snow on the ground and uh, the uh, guy corn stalk sticking up over there in the fields. Jim, what time would the day wrap up? Well, I think it would uh, start to wrap up uh, uh, at dusk. And uh, uh, the relatives and, and members of, of uh, family who were uh, not going to stay overnight would, would uh, hitch up their horses and uh, take off and head for home. Well, Jim, why don't we do just that, too? Let's get uh, aboard the uh, wagon again and uh, head for home, shall we? Let's do it. Jim Keeney, thank you very much for letting us visit with you here at Old Sturbridge Village today. Thank you, and come back again. Today, we have much more leisure time for family get-togethers than did the people of Old Sturbridge Village. But Thanksgiving is still a special day. It is still a time for families to come together from scattered points. And it is still a time when it is good to pause, remember, and be thankful. This is Dick Bertell.